Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, thank the organizers for uh, uh, the invitation to give this Zoom lecture. Um, and uh, today we'll be focusing on a translational story. Uh, it's translational uh, both literally and figuratively. Of course, um, literally, um, mRNA is uh, translated and um, this is a, a translational story in terms of how to make uh, an mRNA drug, in this case, VEGF mRNA. And then um, also figuratively, because uh, translational uh, medicine is, of course, one of the hot topics now where we try to unlock the potential of our science and move it towards advancing uh, human health uh, at the bedside. Uh, and for any kind of translational work, uh, obviously you need an input. Uh, and our input here, um, of course, is based in Sweden uh, and also has been supported by a variety of private sector and academic collaborations. And of course, uh, I'm going to talk to you about two of the translational products today, a way to rebuild the heart and the vasculature and a way to rebuild the heart in terms of muscle. Now, just as a disclaimer, um, I'm a KI professor, but also um, on the scientific advisory board of AstraZeneca and also um, a advisor and a partner of EQT, private equity firm, as well as uh, being involved in several startups in Stockholm. So our menu today, um, we'll talk about a brief timeline of uh, the first time in human mRNA drug, not vaccine, in this case, VEGF mRNA. Uh, we'll talk about how we've been using uh, VEGF mRNA uh, to rebuild the human heart um, uh, or towards rebu rebuilding the human heart and phase one and phase two clinical studies. Um, next generation mRNA, mRNA therapeutics. And then we'll finish on another uh, translational story that's in rapid progress and that's rebuilding the heart with human ventricular progenitors. So let's get started here. So um, many of you, I think, are most familiar with mRNA vaccines at this stage and the amazing story of COVID mRNA vaccines, which is a, a function of uh, over three decades of work. And of course, a concerted effort uh, now of a number of uh, private companies, um, including uh, Moderna, Pfizer, and BioNTech. And this is built on a decade, on decades of work. And remarkably, um, uh, in less than a year from the announcement of the sequence of the COVID mRNA, uh, the COVID uh, viral uh, genome, uh, essentially uh, the vaccines uh, reached uh, full approval in the United States. And now, of course, uh, I think are changing the course of the pandemic uh, where they're available. Uh, now, what's interesting is, is that, of course, all, all of this work occurred um, after uh, 2020, uh, but it was uh, almost a year earlier that the first mRNA drug uh, was tested in human. And this is a story I'm going to tell you about uh, on VEGF mRNA, which may be uh, uh, less familiar, uh, but perhaps more relevant to uh, the audience today, uh, which I understand is largely people interested in uh, pediatric um, heart disease. So um, this is actually the origins of Moderna, which uh, our initial intentions in starting it, and I was one of the four individuals that started it, uh, was to not make a vaccine, but actually make a drug. And I'm going to tell you about uh, quickly about the story uh, that uh, led to this. And in this case, the payload um, is not the COVID spike protein that we're trying to make. It's actually a therapeutic, a paracrine factor, VEGF, which is known to be a very powerful angiogenic factor. But um, attempts, uh, clinical attempts to try to make this into a drug with either protein or gene therapy had failed uh, in human trials. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is you just can't get enough VEGF to actually hit the target, in this case, heart muscle. Um, and uh, we made an uh, observation very early on that VEGF mRNA can be taken up very efficiently by heart and even naked mRNA without any lipid nanoparticle. You inject this into the heart, it's taken up into the heart through an endosomal pathway. Uh, and if it's modified, it escapes uh, innate immunity. So um, you avoid the immune response, uh, which of course would 
uh, be deleterious to have, making the therapeutic payload. The VEGF protein's made, it's secreted, and then it has its action in muscle. And further uh, more, uh, subsequently to that initial observation, which actually was made in around 2011 uh, or so, uh, uh, we reported um, in Nature Biotechnology that a single administration of the mRNA can change the fate of heart progenitors. And uh, instead of contributing to scarring of the heart after myocardial infarction, they will actually rebuild the vasculature. And this was a, a rather dramatic result. And then course, uh, helped launch um, Moderna itself and um, a collaboration with AstraZeneca. And we've worked with AstraZeneca hand-in-hand uh, hand for the last uh, over uh, eight years in trying to move this study towards uh, the clinic. And that's the translational story I'm going to tell you about. So with this mouse work, obviously the next step is, can this be repeated and validated in large animals? Uh, and then uh, subsequently, over the course of the next two years, uh, we were able to do this in collaboration with AstraZeneca and to show that we could get a similar effect uh, in, um, in pigs uh, after myocardial infarction. Uh, so this, of course, was uh, very reassuring. Uh, and with this data, we were poised to attempt um, a uh, clinical study. And in tandem, uh, Moderna optimized all of the different aspects of mRNA technology, because of course this was pre-COVID, but um, Moderna uh, cut its teeth, if you will, uh, on using VEGF as a poster child in the sense uh, where all of the different aspects of the mRNA to optimize the chemical modifications, to optimize the efficiency of capping of the mRNA, which is required for translation, optimize the five prime and three prime on translated region, the poly A tail, optimize purification, and optimize its delivery in, in uh, a variety of different lipid nanoparticles. So all of that uh, occurred and then allowed us to entertain, okay, how are we gonna take this into patients? And this was a critical point, and um, I was very much in favor of not doing this initially in heart, but to see if we could get uh, evidence that we could actually make a therapeutic level of, uh, of uh, protein uh, from an mRNA starting point, because up to that point in time, no one had uh, done any clinical studies of an mRNA for a drug, while many had uh, uh, already been started for a vaccine. The reasons for that, we don't have time to go into that today, but uh, it's just much more difficult to make an mRNA drug than a vaccine. And so um, we decided uh, that instead of doing this in heart, what we would do is try to see if we could have uh, an effect on diabetic patients on reversing their vascular dysfunction with VEGF, because VEGF is a very potent um, activator of uh, vascular flow um, in almost every organ uh, that uh, it's expressed in. And so with this, um, uh, a brilliant physician scientist uh, designed a clinical study, Li Ming Gang, who is a professor um, right uh, in Gothenburg at Salgrenska, and also a vice president of AstraZeneca. And one of the, the, the beautiful things that uh, we've been able to develop with AstraZeneca is a very close collaboration um, with KI. Um, and uh, I'll mention that a little bit later in more detail. So what um, Li Ming had designed was a brilliant idea where we could actually inject mRNA into the forearm of individuals, in this case, diabetic patients. This work was actually done in Germany under um, uh, the uh, review of uh, the uh, Paul Ehrlich uh, Regulatory Agency. Uh, and um, these injections could be um, uh, increased in dose and then to capture the protein so we could actually measure the amount of protein produced from the mRNA in the forearm in patients uh, that were diabetic. And this just shows you the results that we were able to actually achieve what we would have predicted to be a therapeutic level of VEGF from our previous studies in animals uh, with a single injection of, uh, of uh, VEGF, and that this was dose and time dependent. And so we were actually able to measure the level of protein. And this first time in human VEGF mRNA study uh, was published in Nature Communications uh, almost a year before the COVID vaccines were uh, discovered. 
And so um, we went on uh, to then uh, see if there was a functional effect. And diabetics are known to have a blunted response um, to um, agents that would increase blood flow. So in normal patients, you see this increase in flow. In diabetic patients, you see they have a much more blunted response uh, to flow. Um, in addition, um, if you compare the VEGF uh, to the placebo, we were able to, in diabetic patients, get an almost twofold increase in skin blood flow. Um, and then in fact, this level of blood flow was similar to the maximal flow that could be induced by a very well-known agent, acetylcholine, uh, which I think many of you are aware of, is a, a way to uh, maximize vascular flow. Uh, in addition, we're actually able to visualize this by laser scanning microscopy. Um, and here you can see uh, what happens in a placebo uh, situation in an individual patient. And this is what happens when they get VEGF, and we see the signals much higher. So not only is there an increase in protein that's dose and time dependent, there's an increase in flow, in function, showing that not only is the VEGF protein made, it's actually functional. And of course, this is an important difference with vaccines where the protein itself doesn't actually have to be functional. All it has to do is stimulate an immune response. Uh, in addition, of course, the immune response is not what we're looking for here and actually is counterproductive. Uh, so you actually have to devise a way to make enough protein that's functional to have the effect and to reach a therapeutic level. And that's been the challenge with mRNA drugs um, and, and continues to this point. So with this data in hand, we're now uh, in a position, uh, and this was uh, actually the this, this study, the first time a human study was started in 2016, only three years after we reported the data in mouse. And I think this attest to the strength of our collaboration with AstraZeneca. And um, uh, we were in a position then to entertain um, taking this further into heart patients themselves, which we have done now. Um, this is a royal we now because actually I didn't do this. This is work that our collaborators at AstraZeneca did, of course, with input from, from all of us on the team. But in this case, we take patients, open heart surgery, they get multiple injections, uh, and in an area that is at risk, but not yet dead, which we can identify, of course, uh, by a variety of different approaches, including um, O18 PET imaging. And uh, this just shows you uh, schematically what this is like. And uh, this has actually now been completed, I believe, in 13 patients. Um, there are no safety signals. And much of the safety data was already in hand before the vaccine was initiated. Uh, so our comfort zone uh, with, or at least my individual comfort zone with mRNA, with a single injection as a vaccine in your arm, of course, was, was, was quite high. I, I was quite um, uh, sure that this would be uh, viewed as being safe because we'd already had uh, taken this much further in, into patients um, in uh, the setting of open heart surgery. Um, I can't tell you what these results are, but... Um, uh, because they'll be reported uh, later this year. But um, uh, nevertheless, uh, an additional study has been initiated. So here's the phase one study already reported, started in the end of 2016, and uh, then finished up uh, and reported in 2019. Phase 2A now has been completed, and now we're on to phase 2B, which will be a much larger study. Uh, the important point here, though, is actually not these clinical studies, but to show you this gap between what we did uh, in my lab at that time at Harvard uh, and then what we've done together here in Sweden. And uh, it is this ICMC, Integrated Cardiometabolic Center, established by AZ and KI, where we could work together hand in hand that allowed us to then jump and move this project into the clinic forcefully. And I really believe that this played a major role in increasing the uh, level of interest in mRNA as a drug uh, pre-COVID. Now, um, the technology keeps moving ahead. Now we have a way to deliver the uh, payload, the mRNA payload, not uh, with open heart surgery, but with a catheter uh, developed by Stefan Holman. Catheter snakes up through the vasculature, uh, in this case, the renal vein, and then goes out and then delivers the payload. And you can see it right here. Um, the needle retracts uh, from the parenchyma, from the catheter, and then comes back in. 
And this has been designed to maximize retention of payloads, whether they be mRNA or cells. There are a variety of uh, now new targets, I think, for mRNA drugs that we and others are working on. Um, for those of you in pediatric uh, diseases, I think lysosomal storage diseases, including Pompe's, may be a very interesting target for organ-specific delivery, in this case, heart, uh, and also maybe in for kidney. We're very interested in uh, using the technology to, uh, for tolerization. Um, cocktail therapeutics with mRNA, I think uh, we've already used uh, both the combination of VEGF and BMP2 to promote bone repair. Um, and you're hearing about uh, cocktail vaccines where you'd get your shot for the flu and for COVID at the same time. And there are a variety of other approaches. So with that, um, I'd like to finish up with a, a quick uh, reference to another translational story where in this case, we're trying to rebuild the muscle in the heart. And this is also something that we've been working on for um, actually almost uh, a decade and a half. Uh, we discovered a multipotent progenitor in 2005. And then most recently, um, Kylie Fu and others in my group have identified a human ventricular progenitor that you could derive from embryonic stem cells and a renewable source uh, of uh, stem cells that we could then purify um, by antibody purification and that these could be then put into the heart and then regenerate the heart. And this has gone from uh, fantasy now to, to fact, um, at least in, in uh, the experimental setting. Um, this just shows you in um, a, uh, a rodent model, in this case a mouse, that we can get this big chunk of human ventricular muscle where you just inject um, a few million progenitors and they spontaneously expand and differentiate and form a chunk of ventricular muscle. So with this, of course, um, we're moving ahead. Um, this just shows you what the, the cells look like and then shows you can get an increase in function. And now what we've done, um, uh, two independent groups uh, that we're collaborating with, both AstraZeneca and also uh, with a group in Munich, we've been able to show that the HVPs can spontaneously migrate, uh, differentiate, uh, form grafts, and can do this in the absence of arrhythmogenesis in large animals in the pig following myocardial infarction. And so this is an exciting result. Um, uh, the data suggests that the progenitors may have uh, functional advantages over injecting of uh, and differentiated cardiomyocytes. Um, and this is being aggressively pursued now by our group, AstraZeneca and a new Anuco um, that uh, I helped start in Stockholm, uh, Priscilla. Uh, this just shows you um, the effects of the sorting and how you can get a very uh, nice uh, population of enrichment of ventricular progenitors. And uh, of course, uh, this is where we are right now. And um, what we're doing is, uh, and have already done, is optimize an immunosuppressive regimen. This has already been injected in pigs. As I mentioned, we have studies that I think are very encouraging. And then we're moving this forward uh, towards clinical application. We already have uh, generated um, the HVPs from a clinically acceptable GMP level uh, cell line. So we're moving forward, I think, fairly quickly. Um, this is a study, as I mentioned before, that's a result of a collaboration due to the ICMC. I want to acknowledge the leadership of Regina Fritz Danielson and also Christa Betschultz at KI, who was the director of our institute that I was privileged to be a part of. And it's this collaboration of academia, private sector, patients, and also the financial sector that has allowed this work to move forward. And a team of people want to give a shout out, particularly to John Clark, who led the VEGF study for my group in collaboration with AZ in, this, in the very beginning. John now is heading up the Priscilla NUCO. Uh, and then, of course, Kylie Fu and Nevin Whitman, who uh, have also played a major role, particularly Kylie, in the HVP story. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And...